Story five of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five The Hutchings Testimonial naturally all merivale was deeply interested in the adventures of mr hutchings at the front of the war of the three masters who had instantly volunteered only hutchings had actually gone to the front being a skilled territorial and holding a commission in the devons but the other two manwaring and meadows had to be content with kitchener's army because they were ignorant of the subject of warfare and had to begin at the beginning of course fortescue would have proudly gone as his splendid poems on the war and his general valiant feeling showed and we were very sorry we had misunderstood him but his aorta being a bit off quite prevented him doing anything except write splendid poems urging everybody else to go and no doubt many did go because of them as for brown he was five feet nothing or thereabouts and so he wasn't wanted and i believe in secret he thanked god for it though in public he said it was the bitterest blow of his life and rice who doesn't fear brown asked him why he didn't join a gurkha regiment and brown said nothing would give him greater pleasure only unfortunately owing to caste and religion and one thing and another it was out of the question he appeared to bar the bantam regiment also probably not so much as the bantam regiment would have barred him so you may say merivale only had one man at the positive front though jenny dunston the doctor's youngest daughter but two was engaged to a man in the welsh fusiliers and he was there and abbott's father was also there they were of course nothing to us though no doubt a good deal to jenny dunston and abbott's mother but all our excitement centered on hutchings who was a lieutenant and was often believed to do the work of a captain when actually under fire he occasionally sent a postcard to fortescue saying that all was well and i believe fortescue also got a letter with pieces censored out of it but he did not show it to us though he told travers minor and briggs that it was anxious work this was when the british expedition was falling back much to its regret but soon the time came when they got going forward again and then fortescue bucked up and i believe wrote his best poetry in fact fortescue really was a sort of weather glass of the war if you understand me and chaps in his class said that after a reverse you could do simply anything with him and he didn't seem to have the slightest interest in work and didn't care if you were right or wrong and in a way it was equally all right for his class after a victory for then he was so hopeful and pleased that he never came down on anybody so we hadn't got to read the papers because after seeing fortescue in the morning we always knew the general hang of the war in fact mitchell who was a cunning student of other people's characters though his own was beastly said that you had only to look at fortescue's neck to know how it was going at the front if his head was hanging over his chest it was certain the allies had had a nasty knock and if it was just about normal you knew nothing had happened to matter either way and if it was thrown up and straight and fortescue's eyes were bright behind his glasses then you knew that we had scored or else the french or russians had then a little child could lead fortescue as mitchell said and at last came hill number sixty and the fearfully sad news that hutchings was dead or wounded and many of us would have given a week's pocket money to know which then came the good news under the roll of honor that he was only wounded and after that many of us would have given a week's pocket money to know where presently we heard from dr dunston that he was in paris and then we heard that he was coming to england and going to the private house of some very sporting rich people who had turned their mansion into a hospital for wounded officers then fortescue heard from hutchings and most kindly gave us the information that he had been wounded in two places the shoulder and the calf of the right leg and we were thankful that it was no worse we were allowed to write to hutchings and barrington who was head boy now that travers major had left composed a letter and everybody signed it and i hope he liked it but then came the great idea of a presentation to hutchings i am blades and it was my idea though afterwards sutherland and thwaites claimed it 
but i promise you it was mine and we had a meeting in chapel one night before prep at which barrington proposed and i seconded the great thought that we should make a collection of money for a memorial to hutchings barrington said we are met together for a good object namely to collect money for a valuable memorial of his bravery in the war for mr hutchings or i should say lieutenant hutchings everybody here even his own class likes him and the new boys who do not know him would equally like him if they did no doubt there will be a very fine medal of hill number no. sixty struck and presented to our troops who were in that terrific battle and no doubt lieutenant hutchings will get it but it often takes years and years before war medals are struck and presented to the heroes of a battle and i have heard that some of the medals from the battle of waterloo are still hanging fire and many ought to have had them who died a natural death long before they were sent out so i propose that we make a collection for mr hutchings and present him with a valuable object before he goes back to the war because if we leave it till afterwards it may be too late and i said i beg to second the excellent speech you have just heard and if anybody is of a different opinion let him say so it was carried then barrington said we must have a committee of management with a secretary and treasurer and it was done the committee consisted of me and barrington and sutherland and thwaites and rice who would not have been on such an important thing in the ordinary way was proposed because he was enormously popular and would be able to persuade many to subscribe who would not otherwise do so without great pressure that only left the treasurer and well knowing mitchell's financial skill and mastery of arithmetic in general i proposed him some chaps who owed mitchell money were rather shy of voting for him but finally they decided it was better to have him for a friend than an enemy and so they voted in his favor i myself owed mitchell three shillings for which i was paying tuppence a week which was a fair interest and personally i always found him honorable though firm anyway he was made treasurer and he said the subscription list must be posted in a public place because in these cases people like to see their names where other people would also see them and that publicity was the backbone of philanthropy we left it with him as he thoroughly understood that branch of the testimonial and meanwhile from time to time the committee met to consider what ought to be bought and we differed a good deal on the subject i thought as hutchings would certainly go back to the war when he was well we ought to buy him a complete outfit of comforts including blankets tobacco of which he was very fond a thermos flask a wool helmet day socks night socks a mouth guard to keep out german stinks and in fact everything to help him through the misery of warfare including a filter for drinking water and sutherland was rather inclined to agree with me but the others were not thwaites said my dear blades you talk as if you were his grandmother no doubt he's got women relations to look after paltry things like that but a testimonial rises to a much higher plane in my opinion it ought to be something that will last forever and not wear out and be forgotten and rice said get the man a revolver and barrington said he's got one and rice said of course he has and if we get him another then he'd have two and that means six less germans some day very likely but barrington didn't approve we want a testimonial that has nothing to do with actual battle he said the war won't last forever and we ought to buy something useful and also ornamental that hutchings will be able to employ in everyday life when all is over we want something that will catch his eye a hundred times a day and pleasantly remind him and his family of his heroic past and us an heirloom in fact said thwaites but i argued that practical comforts at the critical moment would be far better than an heirloom for future use because if he didn't have the mouth guard and filter and so on he might die and where would the heirloom come in then i said what's the good of knowing you've got a silver ink pot or a tea kettle or a cellaret full of whiskey at home when you're perishing for a wholesome drink in the field and barrington said that was petty and so did thwaites 
they seemed to think that the remembrance of our testimonial safe at home would carry hutchings safe through all the horrors of the campaign it turned out that i had rather touched up barrington for he had actually been thinking about a silver ink pot and thwaites had been thinking about a cellaret with three bottles of various spirits but i told them flatly i didn't agree with them then they asked sutherland his idea and he said it wasn't so much what we should like as what hutchings would he said perhaps a very fine meerschaum pipe mounted in silver with an inscription would do because there you have a creature comfort of the first class and also a testimonial which would not wear out and a pipe would be far more to hutchings either in war or peace than an ink pot or in fact anything of that sort and rice said why not get the man a sword he could use it in the war and if all went well he could hang it up in his home afterwards and if there was blood on it then he'd have great additional pleasure every time he looked at it and so would his family barrington rather liked the sword but he said that classy swords were frightfully expensive and he doubted whether we should run to it then the committee broke up to meet again when we found out how the subscriptions came in unfortunately this department of the testimonial was very slow mitchell with great trouble wrote out a list of the whole school and was allowed to put it on the notice board class by class he wrote it one hundred and thirty-two boys he wrote with money columns and a line leading from each boy to the money column on it in large ornamental letters nicholson who was a dab at printing put the words testimonial fund to lieutenant hutchings from merivale school then we all waited breathlessly for the result in the money column there was some delay because everybody of course wrote home on the subject and mentioned it in the next sunday's letters and we pointed out to the kids that a good and useful thing to write home about and something at least to fill two pages would be the hutchings testimonial whether they made the appeal or not of course none could tell but if they did the response was fearfully feeble when questioned they said that their people at home had done such a frightful lot for the war already that further cash for hutchings was out of the question while other parents wrote back not that they had done much for the war but that the war had done much for them in a very unfavorable manner the result was apparently the same in each case and the lower school all except peterson in the third responded very badly to the appeal he produced ten bob much to our amazement and there was one other ten bob secured by abbott through his mother because his father was at the front and still unwounded as for the sixth who headed the list we all gave three bob to a man except barrington who gave five the fifth came out at about one and ten pence a head which was fair without being particularly dazzling but the fourth fell away a good deal and after that there was a hideous array of blanks mitchell said it was probably owing to the utter failure of the dividends of the parents of the lower school and as we could not apparently make bricks without straw we considered how to tackle the lower school there is no doubt the failure was genuine for many of them had even their pocket money reduced so pegram who had only subscribed a shilling himself by the way proposed that the kids should be invited to give property instead of cash he said if they all yield up something they value we can collect the goods in a mass and have a sale and the proceeds of the sale can go to the hutchings testimonial the committee approved this excepting thwaites who thought nothing of it but when asked to give his objection he merely said wait and see which we did do and found that thwaites was wonderfully right and had looked on ahead much farther than us the kids agreed willingly to subscribe in goods and were only too delighted to do so but when it came to the point the goods of the kids proved utterly worthless in the open market it was a revelation in a sort of way to see the things the kids valued and honestly thought were worth money in fact preston said it was pathetic and pegram said we had a good foundation for a rubbish heap but nothing more 
they brought string and screws and nails also the glass marbles from a certain make of ginger beer bottle and knives fearfully out of order and corkscrews and padlocks without keys and a few threadbare story-books and three copies of hymns ancient and modern and two old horseshoes and catapults and bullets and shot and charms they also brought three steel watch-chains and one leather one and percy minimus offered a watch-chain made from his mother's hair so he said but nobody bid for it naturally for who on earth wants a watch-chain made of somebody else's mother's hair there was also a bottle imp fourteen india rubber balls and seven golf balls all worn out two kids cricket bats unspliced three pairs of tan gloves new but small and one pair of wool ones eight neckties not new and a silk handkerchief given to tudor in case he had a cold in his head but not required up till now and therefore new among other items was half a packet of sanatogen also from tudor a box of chocolate cigarettes several conjuring tricks mostly out of order and three guinea pigs alive of other live things were included a white rat with pink eyes and a hairless pinkish tail and a dormouse which mather said was hibernating though mitchell thought was dead it proved alive on applying warmth and fetched five pence lastly there was a chrysalis into which a remarkable caterpillar found by hastings on the twenty first of last september had turned and as nobody knew the species of moth to be presently produced by it hastings thought it worth money and put a reserve of tuppence on it but the chrysalis was long overdue and so it did not reach the reserve and so hastings who was still hopeful bought it back for that sum as a matter of fact it never turned into anything and was found to be quite hollow when examined there was a good deal of other trash hardly worth mentioning and many lots at the sale did not produce any offer at all let alone competition and the owners of these lots thankfully got them back again though of course sorry that they commanded no market value and some kids were much surprised to find their rubbish had no value at all in the eyes of the larger world so to speak one way and another the sale realized eight shillings and fourpence chiefly owing to the generosity of rice who gave the absurd sum of two shillings for the guinea pigs which were not even the chrysanthemum variety of pig with wild and tousled hair but just sleek ordinary pigs and known to be far past their prime one in fact had a bald head the hutchings testimonial now stood at four pounds fourteen shillings and sevenpence and thanks to a windfall in the shape of five shillings from cornwallis who had a birthday and got a pound for it we were now practically up to a fiver in fact i myself flung in the five pence but we were far from satisfied for as mitchell with his mathematical mind pointed out five pounds spread over one hundred and thirty-two boys amounts to the rather contemptible smallness of nine pence and one eleventh a boy we raised the question of inviting the masters to come in from dr dunston downwards and some fondly thought that dunston would very likely give another five pounds to double ours but Barrington said he had reason to fear this would not happen, because from rumors dropped between Brown and Fortescue, which he had accidentally overheard while working in Fortescue's study, he believed that a good many parents were putting the moratorium in force on the doctor, and Fortescue seemed to think that it was quite within human possibility that the doctor might put the moratorium in force on him and Brown, with very grave results to their financial position but brown said the moratorium was over long ago and could not be revived against them then two things of considerable importance happened on the subject of the hutchings testimonial firstly we heard that hutchings might come to merivale for a week or so before returning to his regiment and secondly mitchell made a very interesting offer concerning the five pounds now deposited with him he said very truly that money breeds money in skilled hands and that no financier worthy of the name ever lets his talent lie hid in a napkin but far from it 
he said to the committee it's like this we are now a fortnight from the holidays and the holidays will be five weeks long five and two are seven therefore it follows that for seven weeks this five pounds is doing nothing whatever this would be untrue to the science of political economy and banking therefore i propose that i send the five pounds to my father and ask him to invest it in his business my father john septimus mitchell esq is a member of the stock exchange of london and would no doubt very easily turn our five pounds into six or even seven in the course of seven weeks this would greatly increase the power of the committee and the extent of the testimonial for hutchings and then at the beginning of next term we shall be able to buy and present the testimonial in person to hutchings well knowing mitchell it was rather a delicate question in a way but what he said was sound finance as barrington admitted and barrington himself felt thoroughly inclined to trust mitchell we went into a sort of private committee after mitchell had gone and though i and thwaites voted against the majority was in favour of agreeing to the suggestion of mitchell and therefore it was done then mitchell sent the five pounds to his father and gave us the cheering news that his father had received it and agreed to invest it at interest and mitchell handed barrington a document from his father to show all was being rightly managed on the stock exchange about it and barrington kept the document carefully as it was legal and had a penny stamp on it we next returned to the question of the testimonial itself and still could not agree about it though we were now able to argue on the basis of seven pounds instead of five we had agreed about a sword but unfortunately found on inquiries that a sword worthy to be called a presentation sword would cost about fifty pounds and ought to have rubies and emeralds in the handle which was of course out of the question many things were suggested but none somehow met the case and we fairly kicked ourselves to think that a committee like us were such a lot of fat heads and of course dozens of the chaps asked us about it and were rather surprised we couldn't think of the right thing proposals were showered in but all to no purpose and the end of the term actually arrived without anything being settled it was then agreed that we should all think hard about the form of the testimonial during the holidays and barrington hoped that events at the front might develop and help us to hit on a happy idea and we all hoped so too as for mitchell he said that he thought very likely hutchings would rather have the money than anything else but that was of course what mitchell himself would rather have had though far below the mind of a patriotic man like hutchings and thwaites said rather scornfully to mitchell that no doubt he would rather have money than an heirloom to hand down to the future generations and mitchell said that he undoubtedly would because money was out and away the best possible sort of heirloom and everybody knew it at heart even though they might pretend different then the holidays took place and the prizes were decidedly skimpy which was a disappointment to those who got them and a comfort to those who didn't nothing of any consequence occurred to me during the holidays and i had no idea for hutchings worth mentioning and when we all returned we found the committee as a whole were in the same position as before there were many suggestions made certainly but none that pleased the entire committee then a dreadful thing upset the situation and for three days the darkness of returning to school was made darker still by a sensational rumour mitchell did not turn up on the appointed afternoon and it was whispered that he wasn't coming back at all presently the whisper grew into a regular roar so to speak and brown announced the tremendous news that mitchell had left altogether and might be going straight into his father's business of being a stockbroker on the stock exchange london to add to this hutchings was now staying at merivale with the doctor for a few days before going back to the war and he had already heard about the testimonial and was undoubtedly in a great state of excitement about it his wounds had taken an unexpectedly long time to heal but he was now quite ready for renewed activity at the front and was in fact going back on the following friday with other healed heroic men 
our position had now become extremely grave and we held a committee meeting instantly and thwaites and i were in the position of the late lord roberts when he clamoured for an army and couldn't get one because we had strongly advised that mitchell should not be allowed to send the money to his father but the committee had outvoted us i was dignified myself and did not remind the committee of my views but thwaites did and there was a good deal of bitterness in the remarks of the committee till barrington reminded us of the legal document which we had preserved with such care he said that he was not in the least alarmed and felt sure that whatever mitchell might be the father of mitchell was a man of honour and would not risk his position on the stock exchange of london for a paltry seven pounds so we wrote to the address on the legal document stating the case and saying politely but firmly that we expected the seven pounds by return of post we added that we trusted mitchell's father implicitly and that as the matter was very urgent owing to mr hutchings being just off again to the front we hoped that he would be so good as to give it his personal attention the moment he received our letter this we all signed to show how many people were interested and that it was a serious affair for three very trying days we heard nothing and the school was in a fair uproar and the committee got itself very much disliked then when we had decided to put the matter into the hands of dr dunstan mitchell himself wrote to me and sent a cheque signed by his father but it was not for seven pounds i regret to say in fact it was not even for six his wretched father had merely sent us back our five pounds with seven pence added mitchell explained that we had received four per cent for our money and that he was sorry nothing better could be done for the moment owing to the stock exchange being very much upset by the war and he asked us for a stamped receipt for the money which we sent him in very satirical language and said that no doubt his father had made the two pounds himself and we promised faithfully that when we grew up and had dealings on the stock exchange of london they wouldn't be with mitchell and his father barrington by the way wouldn't sign this piece of satire which was invented by tracy all the same we sent it but mitchell never answered it and soon afterwards he turned up again having merely been ill and not going to leave at all hutchings was going on the following friday and something had to be done at once the committee which was now fairly sick of the sight of one another met again for the last time i'm glad to say and the question being acute as thwaites said we proposed and seconded that a master or two should be invited to help us with ideas then i thought of something still better and suggested that we should simply and straightforwardly go to hutchings himself and ask him what he most wanted in the nature of an heirloom that could be got for five pounds and sevenpence and everybody gladly seconded this idea though of course it was not so impressive as making a presentation with a few dignified words and the whole school present as we had meant to do however we went to hutchings and he was much pleased and said it was ripping of us all and promised the morning before he went to try and get us a half holiday as a memory of him this was good but still better was the great ease with which hutchings decided what he wanted he said i'll tell you what i'll do on my way through london to dover i'll buy a pair of field glasses and i'll have inscribed somewhere on them to lieutenant t hutchings from merivale school we agreed gladly to this and so did everybody and several chaps who had suggested this very thing and been turned down reminded us afterwards at any rate hutchings got them and wrote to barrington from a direction he couldn't name to say he'd got them inscribed and all and they were splendid glasses and that we might picture him often using them on the field to mark the enemy's position or sweep the sky for aeroplanes which was very agreeable to us to hear and showed all our trouble was by no means in vain and in return we wrote to hutchings and told him we were very pleased to know about the glasses and were glad to inform him that we had got the half-holiday and though it unfortunately poured without ceasing all the time it was quite successful in every other way End of story five.
Story six of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six The Fight. My name is Rice, and there was only one thing I hated about the war, and even that I had to stop hating because of England. My first feeling was the war had come too soon, and that if it had only been four years later, I should have been there. But saying this to Tracy, he pointed out that from England's point of view, it was lucky the war had come when it did, because every year was making the Germans stronger, while we went gaily down the hill, reducing our navy and our army too. So it was a jolly good thing the great war hadn't waited till I went into the army. In fact, in four years, by all accounts, there mightn't have been any army to go into. No doubt you'd have been a host in yourself, Rice, said Tracy in his comical way, meaning a joke that I easily saw. But all the same, as we had to fight Germany, the sooner we did it, the better. So I gave up hating the sad fact of not being there, though it was extra rough on me, because many people seemed to think it was going to be the last war on earth, and if that was so, my occupation was gone, and I might just as well not have been born, except for the simple and rather tame pleasure of being alive. But what's the good of that if you're not going to do anything worth mentioning from the cradle to the grave, as the saying is? As far as mere fighting went, I did all I could at Merivale, and after seven regular fights got to be cock of the lower school. And in ordinary times I should have been cock of the whole school, but curiously enough there was one chap of very unusual fighting ability at Merivale when I was there, and he was rightly regarded as cock of the school in the science of fighting. It happened also that he and I were tremendous chums, such chums as are seldom seen, for we had similar ideas on all subjects, and never differed even on the subject of the boxing art. In fact, we only differed because I was going into the Navy, and Sutherland Minor was going into the law. He had no taste for soldiering, like his brother Sutherland Major, though great genius for boxing, in which he took after his father, and as his father was in the law and wanted him to go into it, he resolved to obey. But to me the law seemed a feeble profession, and I often tried to dissuade him from it. Sutherland Minor was sixteen and a half and tall. I was fifteen and three inches shorter. He had better biceps than me and a longer reach, and he said I had a better punch than him, but less science. After my third fight, he always let me second him in his fights, but he only had two before this particularly interesting fight I am going to mention, and one was against Blades, which he won after six rounds by excellent science and far superior footwork to Blades and the other was against a chap called Pingley, who only came for one term and gave himself frightful airs because he was a Cornishman. But I shouldn't think Cornwall had much use for him. One day Sutherland said that the Cornish might be very good at catching pilchards and digging up tin, but they didn't seem much good at enlisting in Kitchener's army and Pengeley said there was a reason for that, though he refused to tell us what the reason was. Then he got into a fearful bait, and, little knowing the truth about Sutherland, challenged him to fight, which, of course, Sutherland instantly agreed to. Pengeley was very big and strong, and if he had been able to hit Sutherland as often as he wanted to, the fight might have been interesting. But having no science whatever, he was useless against Sutherland, by sheer strength he stuck to it for eight rounds during which time he got a fair doing and sutherland was hardly marked but then though by no means all in pingley realized that he wasn't going to get a knuckle on sutherland and so he gave up he wasn't a bad chap really though rather foolish about cornwall and he even said to me deliberately that a cornishman was as good as an irishman which showed if anything that he was weak in his head and after his fight with Sutherland, he asked him again what the reason was that Cornwall was so slack at enlisting, and he said that the truth was that half of all Cornish chaps go into the navy, which owing to Cornwall being almost surrounded by sea, they prefer. 
but whether that's true or only a piffling excuse i don't know anyway when it came to counting up the most famous men cornwall ever produced he could only mention sir humphrey davy who invented the safety lamp for miners which was undoubtedly all right in its way and q who wrote dead man's rock and was knighted for doing so and nobody ever deserved it more but that was all whereas when it came to ireland of course i could count up thousands of the greatest heroes in creation including mr redmond who has just got home rule for us after fearful obstacles but i never fought pengali there wasn't time for he only had one term at merivale and then i believe went to canada suddenly to an uncle there after that began the curious affair between me and sutherland but as it was remarkable in every way and will never be forgotten by our families i may mention them in the first place sutherland's mother was a chronical invalid i said it must be very difficult to love a person who lived in bed and never be any use out of doors or ride to hounds or anything and he said that it made no difference and that he was accustomed to it because his mother had always been an utter crock ever since he knew her and even at her best when she was feeling unusually fit she only changed her bed for a sofa in his father's study apparently she was just as keen about him as my mother was about me and though she didn't much care to hear about his fights she tried to understand the beauty of them like his father did but naturally this father was more to sutherland than the mother could be because his father had been amateur middleweight champion of england in his time and held the cup for three years and had been runner-up twice also he was therefore a very great boxer and fighter and sutherland had been taught by his father which accounted for his genius at it and his style which was very finished he would undoubtedly have been a pro if he had been in another walk of life but as it was he fully intended to do as well as his father had done in the amateur boxing world though as he was growing very rapidly and was also a great eater it looked as if he would end up by being a heavyweight which his father never was though as sutherland told me his father had beaten a few good heavyweights in his time though he never touched twelve stone in his boxing days sutherland major by the way had just left merivale when the war broke out and he instantly went into the o t c s and soon became a second lieutenant and went to france this father of sutherland was a lawyer and sutherland regretted to say that the war had done him harm as owing to it apparently people were not going to law nearly so much as usual still he thought after the war he might find a great improvement he was a lawyer of the sort called a barrister and wore a wig and gown and pleaded for criminals before the judges and juries on the western circuit often getting them off when it looked jolly bad for them so sutherland said but my father was quite different being a gentleman at large and funnily enough owing to the war he made the first money he had ever made in his life for he had a great knowledge of horses and the war office hearing of this let him go out and choose and buy horses for it which he willingly did and for his trouble he got the enormous sum of a guinea a day my mother sent me a sovereign of my father's earnings and told me to keep it and bore a hole in it and put it on my watch-chain and be proud of it but this i did not do because a sovereign is a sovereign and i simply couldn't see a good sovereign wasting its time so to speak on my watch-chain then one day walking as usual with sutherland on the way to a footer match in which we were both playing both being in the first soccer team him at right back and me at right half we got talking about a fight i rather hoped to have with briggs and sutherland was trying to think of a casus belli which in english means a reason for the fight but knowing briggs he said no casus belli would ever arise and i said in that case if briggs were willing we might fight for a purse if anybody would subscribe one and then sutherland reminded me that i should become a pro and briggs also if that were done he said briggs wouldn't fight just for the sake of fighting and as you and he are very good friends and there's no needle in it it looks difficult 
then we talked and then he happened to say about fighting in general and weights and so on you might just as well think of licking him speaking of hutchings who had gone to the front as you might of licking me of course i said it would be absurd that was the whole conversation and i forgot it while the match was on and in fact it didn't come back to me till i went to bed that night and then it fairly kept me awake and i was fearfully sorry i'd said it would be absurd for me to think of licking sutherland in fact i got sorrier and sorrier and then i wondered why the dickens sutherland thought it was such a mad idea my licking him and before i went to sleep i felt in a way rather sick with sutherland for having such a poor opinion of me in the morning the feeling was still there and he noticed i was a bit off and asked me if i was all right and i said i was but it weighed fearfully and i fairly got to hate myself in about two days for having said the idea of my licking sutherland was absurd in fact the more i thought about it the less absurd it seemed i knew he was heavier and had a longer reach and was older and more scientific but he himself had said that i had a fine punch and if you've got that you never know what may happen and many an unlikely thing has come off in the ring owing to unexpected smacks landing at the right moment in the right place after a good deal of hard thinking and going down about four in my form which landed me at the bottom i felt i must speak to sutherland or i should burst so when he asked me for the thousandth time what was the matter and if anybody had scored off me or anything i said look here sutherland you remember that while going to the footer match last week you said i might just as well think of licking you as of licking hutchings and he said well yes i remember and i said i told you it was absurd didn't i you did naturally answered sutherland well i said i was wrong it wasn't in the least natural for me to say that and there was nothing absurd about it it's been on my mind ever since and now i see it wasn't absurd what wasn't absurd said sutherland the idea of your licking hutchings or the idea of your licking me the idea of my licking you i said firmly for a moment sutherland was quite silent do you really think so he asked yes i said after considering it quietly in bed and in chapel and at many other times i can't see anything absurd about it in fact rice you think you might have a chance against me suggested sutherland i don't say that it would be much of a chance i told him probably you'd do me because you're a lot cleverer and more scientific but when i said absurd i went too far sutherland considered you're quite right he admitted you might get over a lucky one it's very unlikely but you might therefore there would be nothing absurd about our fighting and i oughtn't to have suggested there was somehow i never regarded us as in the same street but of course we may be we're not i said as for boxing on points we're not but fighting is different and well there you are he nodded if you feel like that he said of course i never did feel like that in fact i never thought of it before i told sutherland but now he didn't say anything so i went on it's a matter of honor in a way i said from your point of view it is no doubt he answered isn't it from yours i asked him not exactly he explained we're very good friends in fact more than just common or garden friends and i never thought of fighting you regarding you as cock of the lower school and not supposing the question would ever rise between us as i shall probably leave merivale before you get into the upper school if ever you do still as you feel your honour makes you want to fight me you must of course there's no casus belli otherwise i said and sutherland answered that honour was the best casus belli possible he said of course if you honestly feel that i have wounded your honour rice we must fight and i said well you haven't wounded it exactly in fact i don't know what the dickens you have done but you've done something and though you're my chum and i hope you always will be forever more yet i don't believe i shall get over this feeling or in fact be any more good in the world till we fought 
as a matter of fact said sutherland you've wounded your honour yourself by thoughtlessly agreeing to my suggestion that you couldn't lick me still whatever has done it the result is the same i'm afraid i'm afraid it is i said i suppose no two chaps ever arranged a thing of this sort in a more regretful frame of mind for we had always been peculiarly friendly and the idea of ever fighting had never occurred to us but it was just that fatal remark of sutherland showing his point of view and showing me with only too dreadful clearness his opinion of me as compared with him and the queerest thing of all was that i quite agreed with him really only there was a feeling in me i couldn't possibly let it go at that and of course there was also a secret hope that after all sutherland and i might be mistaken about his being such a mighty lot better than i was so we agreed to fight on the following saturday afternoon as there was only a second eleven match on our own ground and we should have leisure to go into the wood close by where these affairs were settled needless to say the world at large was fearfully surprised when it heard we were going to fight we still pottered about together in our usual friendly way and when we were asked as of course we were what we were fighting for it was more than i could do to explain or sutherland either travers major understood the truth of the situation and i think thwaites did and possibly preston but to have tried to explain to anybody else the frightfully peculiar situation would have been impossible for they hadn't the minds to understand it so we just said in a general sort of way we were still chums but felt such a tremendous interest in the question of which was the greatest fighter that we were going to find out in the most friendly spirit possible of course being easily the two best in the school the sensation was huge but the general opinion seemed to be that i must be mad to think of beating sutherland and i never argued much about it and said very likely i was but that i hated uncertainty in a thing like that pegram said it will be your sedan rice meaning that i should be treated by sutherland like the french were treated by the germans on that occasion but i did not think so i said most likely i shall be licked and badly licked which is nothing against such a man as sutherland but it won't be my sedan by long chalks because we've agreed whichever wins it will make no difference certainly there will be no indemnity said pegram as you're both far too hard up for any such thing but you needn't think the beaten one will ever feel the same again to the winner because human nature is all against it your human nature may be i said to pegram who was a foxy chap great at strategy but otherwise mean your human nature may be like that but mine and sutherland's is not all the same i had pegram to second me because he is full of cunning and i also had travers minor and sutherland had abbott who is a very fine second and would be a fine boxer too but for a short leg on one side williams was his other second and travers major consented to be referee fighting was not allowed at merivale but travers though head of the school and never known to break any other rule supported fair fighting because he believed it was good and he also believed that the doctor did not really much dislike it though no doubt to parents he had to say he did brown however hated fighting and as he was master in charge on the appointed day we had to exercise precautions and keep the fight as quiet as possible though favourable to fighting as a rule travers never cared much about my fight with sutherland and even tried to make us change our minds but he had no reasons that we thought good enough or rather that i thought good enough because of course i was the challenger and sutherland had no choice but to agree it turned out that sutherland was rather glad of the fight because it distracted his mind from sadness a fortnight before he had been home from saturday till monday to see his mother who was worse because his brother tom or sutherland major was in the trenches and his father had been very gloomy about it so the fight served to cheer him up and brighten his spirits which was one good thing it did then the eventful day arrived and the fortunate chaps who knew that this was the appointed time looked at me with awe and as we were getting up in our dormitory percy minimus whispered to me 
you'll look a very different spectacle tonight from what you do now rice the morning seemed long and i jolly near messed up the whole thing and had a squeak of being kept in for the half holiday but i escaped and at last the time came when the footer match was in full swing and brown with a lot of kids watching it then one by one about fifteen of us strolled off including sutherland and me and our seconds and travers major and preston and blades and saunders and perkinson and ash and percy minimus who liked the sight of blood if it wasn't his own no time was lost and a ring was made with a bit of rope while sutherland and i prepared they were two-minute rounds and ash kept the time no two chaps ever shook hands in a more friendly spirit and as to the fight itself as i cannot relate it i may copy the notes that blades took he missed a good many delicate things that we did but the general description though not at all in regular sporting language gives a fair idea of how it went he wrote these words round one sutherland seemed thoughtful and not so much interested as rice rice advanced and dodged about and struck out into the air several times and danced on his feet and once he would have hit sutherland but sutherland ducked his head under the blow and before rice could recover hit him with both fists on the body rice laughed and sutherland smiled they were dancing about doing nothing when ash called time and they rested and their seconds wiped their faces and rice blew his nose with his fingers round two now sutherland began to hit rice a good deal oftener than rice hit him but in the middle of the round rice got in a very fine blow on sutherland's face and knocked him down sutherland instantly rose bleeding but by no means troubled he praised rice and said it was a beauty and rice said don't patronize me sutherland but sutherland did not answer for the rest of the round sutherland hit rice several times but didn't make him bleed it was a good round and both were panting at the end round three sutherland wouldn't let rice get near enough to hit him and kept catching rice's attempts on his arms and his arms being longer than rice's he could land on rice without being hit back he did not hit so hard as rice but he hit rice whereas rice hit the air still rice got in a very good one just in the middle of sutherland's body which doubled up sutherland and before he could undouble again rice had hit him very hard on the face with an upper cut sutherland fairly poured with blood but was quite cool and showed no signs of not liking it he got in a very good blow with his left on rice's neck before ash called time round four it was certainly a very fine fight of much higher class than we had ever seen before at merivale this round was the fiercest up to now and travers major had to caution rice for being inclined to use his head still he fought very finely but it worried him fearfully to be hit so often without getting one back the hits were not heavy hits to the spectator but they must have been harder than they look because rice who has black hair and a very pale skin by nature was now getting a mottled sort of skin in this round they were rather slower than before and stood and panted a good deal and while they panted they looked at one another with a sort of doleful cheerfulness from time to time but there was also fierce fighting and sutherland at last drew blood from rice with a blow on the nose at the sight of his blood rice gave a great display and kept sutherland moving about and at last hit him backwards out of the ring but sutherland instantly returned and went on fighting till the end of the round it was a splendid round in every way round five both were now rather tired and in this round they took it easy but at taking it easy sutherland was much better than rice and did not waste so much energy in fainting he had the best of this round and hit rice twice or three times on the face at the end he fairly knocked rice down and when ash said time pegram and travers minor rushed to pick up rice and carry him to his corner but he rose and walked round six this looked as though it was going to be the last for sutherland was now fresher than rice and evidently stronger rice began the round well but soon fell away and sutherland hit him several times and once over the right eyebrow and cut him and evidently did that eye no good rice made ferocious dashes and sutherland got away from them 
and then while rice was resting sutherland dashed in and rice didn't get away sutherland hit rice on the chest and knocked him down and it looked as though he wasn't going to get up again but he did and still had good strength he was being licked but slowly at the end of the round he got one good one in though it was lucky i must here break off the account of the fight by blades to describe a most amazing thing which made this fight far unlike any other i or sutherland had ever fought after the sixth round we were being mopped up and pegram was advising me to chuck it and i was saying in a gasping sort of way i should try to stick a few more rounds and hope for a bit of luck when to our great horror there suddenly appeared from the trees brown and a man clad in black at first we thought it was a policeman and that brown had heard of the fight and had called a constable to take us up but it turned out that brown hadn't heard of the fight and the man in black was none other than the father of sutherland the famous middleweight of other days he had called to see sutherland and had been sent to the playing field and there he had been met by brown and brown guessing that the big chaps were in the wood had brought sutherland's father actually to the ring side brown of course was furious and wanted to stop the fight and take down all our names but the famous middleweight would not hear of this the moment he found that sutherland was fighting a wave of animation went over him and he begged brown as a personal favor to let us finish he even promised to put it all right with the doctor if anything was said which showed his fighting qualities were still there brown of course curled up but his little eyes blazed and he said that sutherland's father must take the responsibility which he gladly undertook to do then brown giving us a look which told without words what would happen when sutherland's father was gone went back to the kids in the meantime i and sutherland had a fine rest and after that we went on again i wished much that his father had seen the whole fight because i knew now only too well that sutherland had got me and that of course with his father there he'd buck up and do something out of the common and i deeply wished my father were there and not far away buying horses at a guinea a day in ireland but i hoped now with this good rest to last at least two more rounds i may now go on with the description of blades round seven much refreshed by about six minutes rest rice and sutherland began again and sutherland's father watched the fight with a calm and sporting interest he was a clean-shaved man of large size about the shoulders but he had a pale sad-looking face and very thin lips and one ear larger than the other sutherland had to withstand a wild rush from rice and hit rice while he backed away from him which pleased his father but rice was not stopped and he got close to sutherland and hit him very hard on the body until they fell into each other's arms and sutherland's father said break break and then apologized to travers major who was referee they parted and rice evidently much refreshed went after sutherland and hit him about three or four times then sutherland hit him once and then it was time round eight sutherland's father certainly seemed to have brought sutherland bad luck for in the next round rice held his own and though knocked down at the beginning of the round got up and went on and sutherland's father asked me how many rounds had been fought and was very much interested in my notes and owing to him reading them i could not describe this round at the end both were tired one not more than the other round nine rice feeling he had still a chance fought as well as ever in this round and sutherland was clearly not taking anything like his old interest in the fight he kept looking mournfully at his father and didn't seem to care where rice hit him and i could see that his father was a good deal disappointed rice had much the best of this round and sutherland bled again though rice did also round ten it began all right though both could hardly keep up their arms and then without a blow suddenly sutherland shook his head and extended his hand to rice and rice shook it and the battle was over that was the end of what blades wrote but much remains to be told and the fight which was extraordinary in the beginning turned out far more extraordinary at the end i couldn't believe my senses when sutherland gave in 
and nor could his father and then came out the truth which was sad in a way but really much sadder for me than sutherland because what i had thought was a right down glorious victory well worth the pint of blood i had shed and the tooth i had lost turned out to be what you might really call very little better than winning on a foul after the fight sutherland hastened to his father and asked him about sutherland major and heard he was all right and going strong then he actually began to blub and his father rotted him and asked him what the dickens was the matter with him and how he had given in to a chap sizes smaller than himself and then sutherland between moments of undoubted weeping explained he said i never saw you in black clothes before because at home you always wear tweeds with squares and a red tie and seeing you in pitch black of course i thought tom was dead till then i was winning and rice knows i was but after you came and i felt positive tom was dead then sutherland was quite unable to go on and his father asked him however he thought he could have stood there grinning at a kid fight under such sad circumstances then he led sutherland away and explained that he happened to have been attending a funeral near plymouth of some old lawyer friend and he thought he would kill two birds with one stone as they say and come over and have a look at sutherland and tell him they'd heard good news of his brother and that his mother had bucked up again well there it was and much worse for me than sutherland because his grief was turned into joy but my joy was turned into grief winning in that footling way which didn't amount to winning at all in fact it was mere dust and enough to make me weep myself only that was a thing i had never been known to do and never shall in this world or the next however sutherland minor was jolly sporting about it and thoroughly understood how it must look from my point of view he even offered to come to ireland in the christmas holidays if my people would ask him and fight me again on my own ground he couldn't say more but though i gladly accepted the idea of his coming to ireland which was a very happy thought on his part i told him frankly that i should not fight him again at present we may meet some happy day in the amateur championship sutherland i said if i get large enough and you don't get too large no rice he answered for i shall be a heavy weight when i'm twenty and you at best can never hope to be anything but a welter but i hope we'll second each other many a time and oft end of story six story seven of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven percy minimus and his tommy there were three percys at merivale and they were all there together and to masters they were of course known as percy major percy minor and percy minimus but we called them the three maniacs though mad they were nice chaps in a way and did unexpected things and always interested everybody because of their surprises they were all very different but very original owing to their father being a well-known actor and percy major was already an actor by nature and could imitate anything with remarkable exactness from dr dunstan to a monkey on a barrel organ he could even imitate a hen with chickens but he was going for much higher flights when he went on the stage and knew the parts of hamlet and macbeth and richard the third by heart though he said to travers and i heard him that it would probably be many a long day before he got a chance to act these great tragical characters before a london audience his father on the contrary was a comedian and blades had once seen him in a pantomime and liked him and said that he was good percy minor was not going on the stage though when he liked he could be awfully funny only he was generally serious and meant to be a painter his great hope was to take likenesses and he was always practising it and his school books were full of portraits of chaps and masters some you could recognise as for percy minimus he was the maddest of the lot and my special friend we were in the lower third and forbes minimus was also our special friend but he chucked merivale as his parents went to the cape of good hope and took him and then percy and i were left 
percy never came out much while his brothers were at merivale and his only strong point was singing in the choir at music he was an undoubted dab and he liked it and he said that if his voice turned into anything worth mentioning after it cracked he would very likely be an opera singer of the first water and if it failed and fizzled away to nothing after cracking as treble voices sometimes do then he was going to be a clergyman if his father would let him he certainly sang like the devil and mr prowse our music master was fearfully keen on him and arranged solos in chapel for him and people came from long distances on sundays to hear him sing though old dunstan always thought when outsiders turned up to the chapel services it was to hear him preach but far from it well this percy minimus was what you may call sentimental and he certainly was a bit of a girl in some ways i hated that squashy side of him and tried to cure it but i forgave him because he liked me and not many chaps did owing to my having a stammer percy minimus was frightfully interested in my stammer and said it would very likely be cured when i grew up he said that people who stammer when they talk can often sing quite well so i tried and found it was so but here again there was a drawback because my singing voice though quite without any stammer was quite bang off as a voice and even funnier than my stammer percy minimus said it was just the sound a fly made before it died when it was caught by a spider so naturally i chucked it but this is about percy not me he had very kind instincts and was of a gentle disposition for instance when three of the masters went to the war and dr dunstan said he was going to fill the breach and do extra work and take our class while we much regretted it percy minimus thought it was fine of the doctor he said though it is bad hearing for us cornwallis we are bound to admit it is sporting of him because at his great age it must be very tiring to do a lot of extra work and no doubt to take the lower form must be fairly deadly for such a learned man as him it will be deadlier for us i said and of course it was but that shows the queer views that percy gets hardly natural i call it and then when the doctor threw up the sponge and got a new master called peacock to help and fill the gap till after the war when hutchings and meadows would come back if alive percy minimus was queer again this peacock was old and dreadfully humble i don't think he'd ever been a master before and he was very unlike his name in every way and had no idea of keeping order but went in for getting our affection he tried frantically to be friendly but he failed because he was too worm-like being a crushed and shabby man with a thin grey beard and when he attempted to fling himself into a game of hockey and be young and dashing he hurt himself and had to go in and get brandy i believe he was a sort of charity on old dunstan's part really for mr peacock told pegram that he had a wife and six children and his eldest son was at the war and his second son was in the general post office and his eldest daughter was a schoolmistress at bedford fancy telling pegram these things all pegram did afterwards was to make fun of peacock and treat him with scorn and many did the same but percy minimus encouraged him and he liked percy minimus and told him several things about the general post office not generally known peacock finding that me and percy minimus were rather above the common herd told us that he was very anxious about his son at the war and was very interested about the war in general and made us interested in it too he read us a letter from his son at the front and percy minimus said it brought home the horrors especially in the matters of food though not a great eater percy liked nice food better than any other kind and then owing to his great feeling for nice food there happened the curious and in fact most extraordinary adventure of his life he came to me much excited one day with a newspaper it was a week old but otherwise perfect in every way and it had started a scheme for sending the men at the front a jolly good christmas gift for the sum of five shillings the newspaper promised to send off tobacco and cigarettes and sweets and chocolate and a new wooden pipe all in one parcel 
and so as percy minimus pointed out if you could only rake up that amount and send it to the paper it meant that one man in the trenches on christmas day would have the great joy of receiving all these luxuries in one simultaneous parcel from an unknown friend at home i said oh it's a splendid idea and i should like nothing better but of course in our case it is out of the question we've both subscribed to the hutchings testimonial and there's not a penny in sight for me this side of christmas and no more there is for you he admitted this but said because there wasn't a penny in sight it didn't follow we might not by some unheard-of deeds rake up the money in time and i said well knowing what five shillings meant that the deeds would certainly have to be unheard of i said there's a fortnight before you have to send in the money but so far as i'm concerned it might just as well be ten years and he said the problem simply is how to raise five shillings out of nothing in fourteen days and i said well yes and he said it sounds simple enough and i said the hardest problems often do in two days he had got a shilling by selling a thing he greatly valued it was a tie his mother had given him and it was made of sheeny silk and changed colour according to which way you looked at it his mother had given half a crown for it and percy wore it on sundays only it was sutherland who gave the money and that still left four shillings and percy minimus hadn't got another thing in the world worth tuppence he then tried writing home and failed he said his father was out of work and though a very generous and kind father as a rule not just now his mother also failed him she wrote sorrowfully but said that she and his father had done everything about the war they could for the present he then wrote to his godmother and got a shilling encouraged by this he wrote to his godfather who didn't answer the letter fourpence had gone on stamps for these four letters and he was accordingly left with one and eightpence subtracting this from five shillings you will find he still had to raise three shillings and fourpence it looked hopeless and i pointed out there was the additional danger that he might be accused of getting money under false pretenses if he didn't collect the lot but he did not fear that because as he said whatever he might get he could send to some other charity which was open to take less than five shillings there were now seven days left and he began to get very fidgety and wretched he said he was always seeing in his mind's eye a tommy in the trenches waiting and watching and hoping between his fights that percy minimus would send him one of those grand simultaneous packets it got on his nerves after a bit and twice he woke me in the dead of night in our dormitory sniffing very loud i said you're making a toil of a pleasure percy and he said no i'm not whenever i go to sleep i dream of my tommy in the trenches and the parcels are being given out by lord french and my tommy stretches out his hand eagerly and hopefully but there's no parcel for him and he shrugs his shoulders and just bears it and goes back to his gun but it's simply hell for me what's he like i asked to get percy minimus off the sad side of it huge and filthy said percy minimus he has a brown face and a big black moustache and one of the new steel hats and he's plastered with mud and his eyes roll with craving for cigarettes and chocolates oh you needn't worry i said he'll get his parcel all right of course they won't miss him what a fool you are cornwallis he answered still sniffing can't you see that if i don't send a parcel there will be one parcel less and so one man will go without who would otherwise have had a parcel and that man will be this one i see in my dreadful dreams well if you put it like that i said of course then he had another beastly thought i've got an idea the man is peacock's son he said and i feel a regular traitor to peacock now every time i look at him then why don't you ask him for some money i naturally answered i feel he hasn't got any replied percy but i can try besides i said his son may be an officer and of course they would be far above parcels i hope he is said percy but i don't think he is and nobody would be above a parcel at a time like that anyway he asked peacock and peacock gave him sixpence and wished he could do better this made two and tuppence and the same day percy found a threepenny piece in the playground and though at another time he would have mentioned this with a view of returning it to the proper owner now he didn't but said it was a providence and added it to the rest 
and this gave him another hopeful idea and he mentioned the parcel for his tommy in his prayers morning and evening and asked me to do so too i was fed up with the whole thing by now because percy was getting fairly tormented by it and even said he saw the tommy looking at him in broad daylight sometimes over the playground wall or through the window in the middle of a class still i obliged him and prayed four times for him to get his two and seven pence but there was no reply whatever and in this way two days were wasted then he had a desperate but brilliant idea and told me he said after school on friday in the half hour before tea i'm going to break bounds and go down into merivale and stand by the pavement and sing the solo from the anthem we did last sunday many people who sing along by the pavement make money by doing so and i might if you're caught dunston will flog you i reminded him but he was far past a thing like that his eyes had glittered in rather a wild way for three days now and he said the tommy with the black moustache was always looking reproachfully at him and if he shut his eyes he saw him more distinctly than ever in fact he was getting larger and more threatening every minute he said a mere flogging is nothing to what they endure in the trenches it was a sporting idea and i would have risked it and gone with him in fact i offered being his great chum but he would not allow me no he said nothing is gained by your coming this is entirely my affair besides you wouldn't tempt people to subscribe so he went and escaped in the darkness and i waited at the limit of bounds with great anxiety to meet him when he came back my last word to him was not to sing this bit out of an anthem but something comic about the war but he didn't know anything comic about the war and he said even if he did that such a thing would only amuse common people who could not be supposed to give more than half pence if they gave anything at all whereas a solo from a fine anthem would attract a better class who understood more about music and were more religious and consequently had more money so he went and in about twenty minutes to my great horror i saw him being brought back in the custody of brown our well-known master the hateful brown always loves to score off anybody not in his own class and so seeing percy warbling out of bounds in the middle of merivale and about ten people mostly kids listening to him he pounced on the wretched percy and dragged him away he had been singing about ten minutes when the blow fell and he was fearfully upset about it because everything had been going jolly well and he had already made no less than seven pence in coppers all from oldish women he had been told to go away from in front of a butcher's shop but nobody else had interfered with him in the least and he had sung the anthem solo through twice and was just off again when the brutal brown came along and saw the merivale colours on his cap recognized percy minimus and very nearly had a fit so there it was and he got flogged and dr dunston said it showed low tastes and would have been a source of great sorrow to his father and he also said that to explode a sacred air in that way in hope of touching the charitable to fill his own pocket was about the limit and a great disgrace to the school in general all of which went off percy like water off a duck's back and the flogging didn't seem to hurt him either and there were four days still and he said his tommy grew larger and larger until he was almost as big as a house in fact percy minimus was rapidly growing dotty and as his great friend i felt i must do something or he would very likely get some other dangerous illness or have a fit or lose his mind forever and become a maniac in real earnest so i told percy minor but unfortunately he and my percy had quarrelled rather bitterly for the moment and percy minor said he didn't care what happened to percy minimus and that if he went out of his mind he wouldn't have far to go while as to percy major i couldn't tell him because he had left merivale the term before the matron now discovered that percy was queer for she'd been making him take pills for two days and then one night hearing him sigh fearfully after he was in bed she tried his temperature and found it about three hundred degrees of warmth so she lugged him off to the sick-room and dr weston came in his motor and said he couldn't see any reason for it and gave percy some muck to calm him down 
next day he was kept in the sick room though cooler and when dr weston came on that day and questioned percy in a kind tone of voice he explained the whole thing to the doctor and said that he was in fearful difficulties of mind and dr weston asked him what difficulties and he said for two shillings which added to three makes five then the doctor told him to go on so he did and showed the doctor the advertisement from the paper about the simultaneous parcels he also said that his tommy had now grown as big as a cloud in the sky and was always looking at him by night and day hungrily and urging him on to fresh efforts and he also said that if he was only allowed to go into the streets and sing an anthem for an hour or two the two shillings should be accomplished and all would be well and encouraged by the great interest of dr weston percy minimus ventured to ask him if he thought he could ask dr dunston to allow this to be done seeing it meant great comfort and joy for a tommy in the trenches on christmas day it made percy much cooler and calmer explaining why his temperature had run up and the doctor said it was undoubtedly not good for percy to have the tommy so much on his mind he didn't approve of the idea of percy singing either but he put his hand into his waistcoat pocket and produced a two-shilling piece as if it was nothing and he said that if the matron or somebody would get a postal order for five shillings and send it off at once he had every reason to think that percy would soon recover which was done and i was allowed to see percy and bring from his desk the cutting out of the newspaper which he had already signed with his name and address which were to go to the front with his parcel and percy said that a great weight had now been lifted from his brain which no doubt it had anyhow when dr weston came next day he found percy in a bath of perspiration and was much pleased and said he was practically cured and percy told him that his tommy had now shrunk to about the size of an ordinary tommy and only came when he was asleep and was not in the least reproachful but quite pleasant and nice and one day later the tommy disappeared altogether and percy minimus became perfectly well in fact before the holidays arrived he seemed to have forgotten all about his tommy and i took jolly good care not to remind him he got fearfully keen about dr weston then and said that he was the best man he'd ever seen or heard of and he even hoped that next term he might run up to three hundred degrees again just for the great pleasure of seeing and talking to this doctor once more but that wasn't all by any means in fact you might say that far the most remarkable part of the adventure of percy minimus had yet to come he went home for the holidays and when he came back much to my astonishment he was full of his blessed tommy again he actually said that he'd got a photograph of him i thought that coming back to school had made him queer once more but he wasn't in the least queer for i saw the photograph with my own eyes it was like this the tommy who had got the christmas parcel which percy's five shillings bought found percy's address in it according to the splendid arrangement of the newspaper and though far too busy in the trenches to take any notice of it just then he was not too busy to smoke the new pipe and the cigarettes and eat the various sweets no doubt between intervals of fiery slaughter but he kept percy's address in his pocket for he was a good and grateful man and then most unfortunately he was hit in the foot by a piece of shrapnel shell and though far from killed yet so much wounded that he had to retire from the front in fact he was sent home to recover and one day in hospital about a week before the end of the holidays he had found percy minimus's name and address in the pocket of his coat and had written percy a most interesting letter of four pages saying that the parcel had been a great comfort to him and that he had sucked the last peppermint drop only an hour before being shrapneled and having been photographed several times in the hospital by visitors he sent percy minimus one and there he was i said it was a jolly interesting thing and so on but i couldn't for the moment see why percy was so frightfully excited about it because it was quite a possible thing to happen though of course very good in its way and a letter he would always keep and he said you don't seem to see the point cornwallis it's a miracle and i said why and he said because this is the very identical tommy i was always seeing in my dreams the very identical one 
i hadn't thought of that but somehow taken it for granted then he pointed out it wasn't in the least a thing to take for granted but the purest miracle that ever happened in the memory of man and quite beyond human power to explain it in the world i said there might be people in the world who could but he wouldn't hear of such a thing he said no not in this world but no doubt there are in the next and i said then you'll have to wait and he said it's done one thing it's quite decided me about my future i'm going to be a clergyman and i said not if your voice doesn't crack surely my voice answered percy minimus with great scorn what is a voice compared to a miracle if miracles happen to you then if you've got any proper feeling you ought to insist on being a clergyman so i suppose he will be but whatever else he is even if he rises to be a canon or a bishop he'll always be a maniac the same as his brothers End of story seven. Story eight of the Human Boy in the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight: The Prize Poem. Things were beastly dull at Merivale when we went back after the Christmas holidays, and I believe even the doctor felt it. Of course, from our point of view, his life must always be deadly, but I suppose he gets a certain amount of feeble excitement into it in ways not known to us it's rather interesting to wonder what old people do find worth doing yet they must do something to amuse themselves off and on or they go mad i should think which they seldom do the amusements of a very old person must be rather weird yet they clearly like to be alive for when my grandmother died she was eighty a time of life when you'd think there was simply nothing left yet when i went to say farewell to her she told me she hoped to see the spring flowers once more she didn't but it shows how fearfully hard up old people must be for amusement of any kind for who on earth would want to see flowers spring or otherwise if practically everything else had not been lost to them myself i would much rather have died years before than eat the food my grandmother ate and never go out except in a bath chair but she found it good enough strange to say so no doubt dr dunstan who is entirely active and can eat meat and drink wine and walk rapidly about still finds being head of merivale school all right but the winter term was deadly what with the bad weather and the slow progress of the war and losing most of our football matches owing to having a very weak team then old peacock of all men the new master i mean got an idea and fortescue thought it was a good one and peacock proposed it to the doctor and dr dunstan agreed to it in fact he announced it after chapel during the third week of february in these words our new friend dr peacock has made a proposal to me and i have great pleasure not only in agreeing with him but in congratulating him on a very happy thought suspecting that there might be mute inglorious miltons among us a sanguine hope i cannot share mr peacock has thought it would add an interest to the term and wake a measure of enthusiasm and energy in the ranks of our versifiers if we initiate a competition he suggests a prize poem upon the subject of the war and while my heart misgives me yet i bow to mr peacock's generous proposal you are invited one and all of you from the greatest to the least to write a prize poem on the subject of the war and if such a momentous theme fails to produce some notable addition to our war poetry then mr peacock's disappointment will be considerable he trusts you to enter upon this task in no light spirit and when i add that mr peacock proposes to give a prize of one guinea twenty-one shillings to the victorious poet you will see that a great effort is needed you will have a calendar month to prepare and execute your verses which must be composed outside the regular school hours and i may tell you that unless a certain humble standard of intelligence and poetic ability is reached i shall direct mr peacock to withhold his prize well there it was and of course a good deal of excitement occurred and it was jolly interesting to see who entered for the prize poem and who did not no doubt travis major would have won it without an effort being so keen about everything to do with war but luckily for the rest he had left to go to woolwich the term before 
travers minor entered because he was strongly advised to being a flyer at literature in general and keen about poetry but he said frankly he should not praise the war but slate it because he utterly disagreed with it and hated war in general of course the prize being a guinea made a lot of difference and many unexpected chaps decided to write a prize poem though most of these when they sat down with pens and ink to do it found such a thing quite beyond them in every way i myself my name is abbott was one of these and after reading a good many real poems of the war which mr fortescue who was a great poet and much interested in the competition kindly lent me i found on setting out to do it that the difficulties were far too great rhymes are easy enough to get in a way but when you come to string the poem together you generally find your rhymes aren't solemn enough i believe i could have written a screamingly funny prize poem but of course that wouldn't have pleased the doctor or peacock either so it wasn't any good wasting time being funny for instance i wrote the following poem in less than ten minutes the hun the hun the footling hun most certainly doth take the bun and blades and several other chaps said it was jolly good but blades who had also had a shot or two on the quiet was like me he could only make comic poems and the stanzas of his poem took the form of limericks he said he could invent them with the greatest ease in class or at prayers or at meals or going to bed or getting up or in his bath in fact at any time when he wasn't playing football he gave me an example which seemed to me so frightfully good that i thought very likely peacock would have given him a consolation prize so i tried it on peacock but mr peacock thought nothing of it and said that was not at all the spirit of a prize poem but belonged to the gutter press whatever that is it ran like this the kaiser set off for paris as if it was only a spree but old french's army it soon knocked him barmy and now he is melancholy he next had a flutter at nancy though doubtless a little bit chancy but his men got a doing with plenty more brewing so he galloped off saying just fancy there were hundreds more verses in fact you might say the whole history of the war as far as it had got and i advised blades to send it to the times to buck it up or a punch or something but he wouldn't and when peacock decided it was no use he gave up writing it so a good poem was lost in my opinion many fell out before the appointed day for sending in the prize poems but many did not and though it was natural that a good few chaps chucked it the extraordinary thing was the number of chaps who kept on to the bitter end so to speak and sent in poems almost the most amazing was mitchell he certainly had made a rude poem once in a moment of rage but as to real poetry a cabbage might just as well have tried to make a poem as him he was only keen about one thing in the world and that was money and of course that was why he entered the competition he said to me i'd do much worse things than make a prize poem if anybody offered me a guinea if it had been one of the doctor's wretched prizes i wouldn't have attempted it but a guinea is a guinea and as nobody here can make poetry for nuts i'm just as likely to bring it off as anybody else it's taking a risk in a way but i've got my ideas about the war just as much as travers minor or sutherland and if i don't win i shall get a bit of fun out of it anyway he was a mean beast always but cunning and frightfully crafty and as he had never had a decent idea in his life let alone a poetical one we were all frightfully interested in mitchell's poem on the war the chap sutherland he had mentioned was regarded as having a chance for he knew a lot about the war and had two cousins in it one in france and one with the fleet he got letters without stamps on them from these chaps but there was never much in them thwaites also entered and he was known to write poetry and send it home but it had not been seen and thwaites being delicate and rather fond of art and playing the piano and such like piffle we didn't regard him as having warlike ideas besides once when blades suddenly pulled out one of his teeth in class and bled freely over thwaites who sat next to him thwaites fainted at the sight of blood 
which showed he couldn't possibly write anything worth mentioning on such a fearful subject as war because you may say a war is blood or nothing only one absolute kid entered and this was percy minimus who had sent a christmas pudding to the front and had the photograph of a tommy back so he wrote a prize poem which he let his friend see and forbes minimus said it was good as far as he could say to the contrary no doubt it appeared so to a squirt like forbes minimus but of course it could not be supposed to stand against the work of travers minor or sutherland or rice i always rather thought myself that rice might pull it off being irish and a great fighter by nature unfortunately he didn't know anything whatever about poetry yet his fighting instinct made him enter and though he wasn't likely to rhyme very well or look after the scanning and the feet and the spondees and dactyls and all that mess which no doubt would count yet i hoped that for a simple warlike dash rice might bring it off i asked him about it and he said a good many things had gone wrong with it but here and there were bits that might save it he said i believe i shall either win the guinea right bang off or get flogged which interested me fearfully but didn't surprise me because it was rather the way with rice to rush at a thing headlong and come out top or bottom he only really kept cool and patient and never ran risks when he was fighting but at everything else which he considered less important he just dashed he had dashed at the prize poem very different from tracy who was always cool about everything and wouldn't have gone to the front himself for a thousand pounds tracy was great at satire in fact satire was a natural gift with him and though of course it didn't always come off owing to being so satirical that nobody saw it still he often did get in a nasty one and sometimes got licked for doing so he told me his prize poem was all pure satire and i said i doubt if the doctor or peacock will see it and tracy said i can't help that poetry is art and i can't alter my great feeling for satire to please them it will come out and even though old dunston and peacock don't see it i know jolly well the kaiser and the crown prince would if they read it well there it was and that was about the lot worth mentioning who had a shot at mr peacock's guinea the calendar month passed and one day when classes began the doctor appeared supported by peacock fortescue and brown everybody was summoned into the chapel and the doctor who dearly likes a flare-up of this kind told us that the prize poems had been judged and were going to be read i may tell you he said that the prize has been won contrary to my fear that none would prove worthy of it but we are agreed that there is a copy of verses on the solemn subject set for discussion that disgraces neither the writer nor merivale indeed i will go further than that and declare that one poem reflects no small credit on the youthful poet responsible for it and mr peacock and mr fortescue than whom you shall find no more acute and critical judges share my own pleasure at the effusion the doctor then began to read the prize poems and he started with that of percy minimus much to percy's confusion the views of percy minimus on the war are elementary as we should expect from a youth of his years said old dunston i may remark however that he rhymes with great accuracy and if he shows an inclination to be didactic and even give lord kitchener a hint or two i frankly pardon him for the sake of his concluding line this reveals in percy minimus a flash of elevated feeling which does him infinite credit one can only hope that his pious aspiration will be echoed by those great nations doomed to defeat in the appalling catastrophe which they have provoked then he gave us the poem the war by percy minimus war is a very fearful thing i'm sure you'll all agree but sometimes we have to fight in order to be free the germans want to slaughter us and do not understand we are a people famed in fight and also good and grand we never were unkind to them and never turned them out when unto england's shores they came to trade and look about but all the time i grieve to say they only came as spies so that when came the dreadful day they take us by surprise 
which they did so and if our ships had not been all prepared the germans would have landed and not you or i been spared now all is changed and very soon upon the belgian strand i promise you a million men of english breed will land and thanks to good lord kitchener their wants will be supplied with splendid food and cosy clothes and many things beside but he must bring the big siege guns when antwerp we shall reach because with these fine weapons we have got to make a breach so let us pray that very soon we smash the cruel hun and if by dreadful luck we lose oh then god's will be done we applauded percy minimus for his sporting attempt feeling of course it was piffle really but good for a kid then the doctor said he was going to read rice mr fortescue said dunstan has evinced the deepest interest in the achievement of rice he tells me that there is now a movement in art including the sacred art of poesy which is known as the futurist movement rice's efforts reminds mr fortescue of this lamentable outrage on the muses for it appears that the futurist desire to thrust all that man has done for art into the flames to forget the glories of greece to pour scorn on the renaissance to begin again with primal chaos in a world where all shall be without form and void this is nihilism and a crime against culture for some mysterious reason the boy rice who we may safely assume has never heard of the futurists until this moment appears to have emulated their methods and shared their unholy extravagance of epithets their frenzied anarchy their scorn of all that is lovely and of good repute he even permits himself expressions that at another time would win something more than a rebuke i will now read rice not for my pleasure or yours but that at least you may learn what is not poetry and can never be mistaken for poetry by those who like ourselves have drunk at the pyrian spring war by rice smash crash crash bang crash bang rattle 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 and crash again air full of puffs of smoke where shells are bursting overhead scream of shrapnel over the trenches and yells of rage roar of men charging and howling a savage song now we shan't be long tramp of feet then flop they fall dropping out here there and everywhere and rolling head over heels like rabbits and some sit up after the charge and some don't shot through the heart or head they roll gloriously over all in but on go the living shouting and screaming and some bleeding and not knowing it as loud as the jack johnsons they howl their rifles are at the charge and the bayonets are white the white arm that goes in in front and out behind or in behind and out in front of the germans running away the boche hates the white arm it sends him to hell by the millions crash crash squash smash 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 the trench is reached blood spurts and bones crack like china gurgles chokes yells helmets fly bayonets stick and won't come out everybody is dead or dying in the trench except twelve tommies dams growls yells choked with blood death awful wounds mess corpses legs arms heads all separate the trench is taken and england has gained a hundred yards hurro 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 and what must it be to be there signed rice i looked at rice while his poem was being intoned by the doctor he had turned very red but he stuck it well and somehow though of course it was right bang off and no rhymes or anything i liked it and mr fortescue liked it as he afterwards told rice but the doctor and mr peacock fairly hated it so that was the end of rice they thought nothing of tracy's poem either the doctor said tracy has produced what for reasons best known to himself he calls a satire it possesses a certain element of crude humour which on such a solemn theme is utterly out of place upon the whole i regard it as discreditable in a sixth form boy and do not think the better of tracy for having written it he then read tracy a satire by tracy no doubt o kaiser you have thought napoleon was a duffer compared to you when you set out to make old england suffer 
but if you read your history books you'd very quickly find sir that bonny knew despite his faults how to make up his mind sir you flutter up you flutter down you flutter night and day sir yet somehow victory won't look your mad and fluttering way sir but when the war by us is won and in berlin our men sir you'll be a bit surprised to find where you will flutter then sir we laughed and thought it ripping but the doctor seemed to be hurt and said silence silence boys it ill becomes us to jest at the spectacle of a fallen potentate and still less so before he has fallen a more pleasing effort is that of travers minor went on the doctor picking up the poem of travers we have here nothing to be described as a picture of war but rather the views of an intelligent and christian boy upon war personally i think well of these verses they are unostentatious no flash of fire but a temperate lament on war in general and a final conviction not lacking in shrewdness i will not say that i entirely agree with travers minor in his concluding assertion but he may be right he may be right at any rate the poem is a worthy expression of an educated mind and by no means the worst of those with which we are called to deal he then read Travers Minor, and we were all frightfully disappointed, for it turned out that Travers hated war, so the result wasn't a war poem at all, but a very tame affair without any dash about it. In fact, very feeble, I thought. His brother would have despised him for writing it. Of course, Peacock wanted a poem praising up the glory of war, not sitting on it like Travers Minor did. The Fog of War by Travers Minor from out the awful fog of war one thing too well we see that man has not yet reached unto his highest majesty for battle is a fiendish art we share with wolf and bear but man has got a soul to save he will not save it there this is the twentieth century we boast our great good sense and yet can only go to war at horrible expense of human life it makes us beasts we shout and spend our breath to hear a thousand enemies have all been blown to death and each of all those thousand men was doubtless good and kind as those no doubt remember well whom he has left behind and when i hear that war brings out our finest qualities i do believe with all my heart that is a pack of lies a deadly silence greeted the prize poem of travers minor and i believe the doctor felt rather sick with us for not applauding it and tracy who was very mad at what the doctor had said about him whispered rather loud that travers minor's efforts was almost worthy of hymns ancient and modern there were only three poems left now and the excitement increased a good deal because nobody had won peacock's guinea yet so it was clear that either mitchell or thwaites or sutherland minor was the lucky bargee both mitchell and thwaites seemed beyond the wildest hope and we felt pretty sure that sutherland must have done the trick but he hadn't the doctor picked up his poem and put on a doubtful expression i confess that sutherland gives me pause he said for skill in rhyming sutherland deserves all praise he is ingenious and correct but such is the faultiness of his ear that he flouts the fundamentals of prosody in each of his four stanzas in fact sutherland's poetry regarded as such is excruciating he has ideas though not of a particularly exalted character and even if he had given us something better worthy to be called a poem his lamentable failure in metre would have debarred him from victory his last verse contains an objectionable suspicion we might associate rather with a commercial traveller or small tradesman than with one of us well sutherland's wasn't bad really though rather rocky from a poetical point of view as the doctor truly said khaki forever by sutherland loud roars the dreadful cannon above the bloody field while like the lightning through the smoke's dim shroud the tongues of flame are flashing where concealed the vainglorious enemy's battery doth vaunt and laugh aloud thinking that men of british race are going to yield 
poor german cannon fodder little do they know that those who wear the khaki have never yet wherever at the call of bellona they may go surrendered to a lesser foe than death they've met far finer fighters than the boche and made their life-blood flow whether upon the open battle-front or in a trench or in a fort or keeping communications with such a leader as great general french the british khaki boys defeat all nations and in the foeman's gore their glittering bayonets they quench and they will win for right is on their side and when they do the neutral shall not share the rich earned booty the allies divide for as they would not sail in and fight it is not fair that they should win the fruits of this bloody tide we could see what the doctor meant about sutherland's poem it didn't flow exactly but it might have been worse then dr dunston picked up mitchell's poem and frowned and peacock frowned and fortescue also frowned we didn't know what was going to happen for the doctor made no preliminary remarks on the subject of mitchell he just gave his glasses a hitch and glared over the top of mitchell's effort and then read it out old england forever by mitchell oh now doth death line his dead chaps with steel the swords of soldiers are his teeth his fangs and now he feasts mousing the flesh of man rejoice ye men of england ring your bells king george your king and england's doth approach commander of this hot malicious day our armour that marched hence so silver bright hither returns all gilt with german blood our colours do return in those same hands that did display them when we first marched forth and like a jolly troop of huntsmen come our lusty english all with purple hands died in the slaughter of their teuton foes but to their home they will no more return till belgium's free and france is also free then to their pale their white-faced shore whose foot spurns back the ocean's roaring tides and coops from other lands her islanders even to that england hedged in with the main that water-walled bulwark still secure will they return and hear our thunderous cheers but belgium first unhappy stricken land which has we know and all too well we know sluiced out her innocent soul through streams of blood which blood like sacrificing abels cries even from the tongueless caverns of the earth to us for justice and rough chastisement and by the glorious worth of our descent our arm shall do it or our life be spent the doctor stopped suddenly and flung his eyes over us naturally we were staggered and full of amazement to think of a hard blade like mitchell producing such glorious stuff any fool could see it was poetry of the classiest kind do you desire to hear more shouted the doctor and we said yes sir then seek it in the immortal pages from whence the boy mitchell has dared to steal it he thundered out and growing his well-known deadly red colour with predatory hand and audacity from which the most hardened criminal would have shrunk this abominable boy insolently counting on the ignorance of those whose unfortunate duty it is to instruct him has appropriated the bard to his own vile uses and his cunning has led him to interpolate and alter the text in such a manner that sundry passages are made to appear as one mitchell will meet me in my study after morning school i need say no more words fail me and they actually did which was a record in its way the doctor panted for a bit then he picked up mitchell's poem or rather shakespeare's as if it was a mouse that had been dead a fortnight and dropped it on the ground it was rather a solemn moment especially for mitchell and the only funny thing about it was to see the sixth of course they'd been had by mitchell just the same as us in the fifth in fact everybody but they tried to look as if they'd known it was shakespeare from the first as for mitchell he had made the rather rash mistake of thinking old dunston and peacock and fortescue didn't know any more about shakespeare than he did and now he sat awful white but resigned 
as a matter of fact he got the worst flogging he ever did get and had a narrow squeak of being expelled also it calmed him down for days afterwards and he was also called king john till the end of the term as a mark of contempt which he badly hated then the doctor snorted himself calm and his face grew its usual colour he picked up thwaites and ended with the tamest poem of all in my opinion which shows that grown-up people and boys have a very different idea about what is poetry and what isn't the verses of thwaites have won the poet's bay said dr dunstan thwaites alone has written a work worthy to be called a poem his stanzas possess music and reveal thought and feeling neither technically are they open to grave objection i congratulate thwaites though not robust or a pillar of strength either in his class or in the field he possesses a refined mind a capacity of emotion and a power for expressing that emotion in terms of poetry that time and application may possibly ripen and mature such at least is my opinion and those who have sat in judgment share it with me he then gave us thwaites a twittering sort of stuff and interesting not because thwaites had got the poet's bay whatever that is but because he had landed peacock's guinea nobody much liked his prize poem except the masters and even thwaites himself said it wasn't any real good and was written when he had a beastly sore throat and was feeling utterly down on his luck in fact he was going to call it lines written in dejection at merivale like real poets do only he got better before he finished the last verse and so did not to the earth by thwaites suffer sad earth no pain can equal thine thy giant heart must ever be a shrine for all the sorrows of humanity as one by one the stricken ages die the bright beams of the stars are turned to tears and howling winds that whistle down the years sigh sorrow 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 and are gone into the silence of oblivion suffer great world the poison fangs of death can only wound not kill thee lo the breath of everlasting dawn is in the wind the distant throbbing of a giant mind shall set the music of the universe once more in time with harmony coerce the discord of a warring race to seize and sorrow die within the arms of peace Thwaites spent his guinea almost entirely on tuck, and though he was very generous with it, and shared the grub with the competitors Rice and Sutherland Minor, who were his friends, he still kept enough to make himself ill again, for it was one of the unlucky things about Thwaites that any muck really worth eating always bowled him over. He wrote a poem three times as long as his war poem called Effect of Coconut Rock on the Tummy of Thwaites but dunstan wouldn't have purred much over that end of story eight